Bibles, they open the book of John, the Gospel of John this morning. I'm so thankful that we serve, that we can follow a Savior who is alive. There are many religions out in society, in the world. Many different ways that people say that you can go to heaven or have a better afterlife. Many different methods by which uh, we can ensure, we are told, that when we pass, that it will be better for us. But the Bible gives us one way. In fact, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, not our text for this morning. The Gospel of John, which we began last week to uh, begin to look over this next few weeks in the Gospel of John, the series, we find that in John, it is a book of decision. The book, if I can, of, of some opposites. One way versus a multitude of ways. Belief versus unbelief. Light versus darkness. And last week we looked in the first chapter of John and saw what I would believe is the point of John that God came to dwell, came to live among men. Jesus is God and God is Jesus. Jesus is God and the Bible tells us that and John explains it to us. John is in this book communicating a very powerful, life-changing book. I mentioned this briefly last week, but when John, history tells us, when John wrote this book, this book was penned toward the end of the books of the New Testament. And that what church history tells us is that most of the books were written in the New Testament, but John, the Gospel of John, was toward the end. John and then the three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then Revelation, all written by the Apostle John. And John, this book John, was purportedly written probably around 85 to 100 A.D. And we know from the timelines as we study that Jesus Christ's ministry was right around that 30 to 35 A.D. mark. So around 50 to 70 years later when the Gospel of John was penned. At this point, a lot has happened in church history. There has been intense persecution. There has been men and women old and young, children and adults who have given their life for this belief in Jesus Christ. But as John writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, understand that, that John is now writing to a group of people, many who perhaps have never met Jesus Christ physically. Now John had. In fact, in 1 John, John tells us that we have handled, we have touched the word of life. He had given Jesus Christ probably a hug. He, he had touched his shoulders before. But now writing to a group of people and to us who we've never physically interacted with Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to a portion of Scripture. We will, we will land here for a second and then move to our portion for today. But look in John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, we find an account where Jesus Christ has been appearing to his disciples after the resurrection. And there are some disciples who don't believe that Jesus Christ is alive, including one famous disciple who is known by the name of Thomas, who is more affectionately known in our circles, those who know the Bible, as, if you know the first word that we often put in front of his name, what is it? Doubting Thomas. And in this particular account, we find out through the, through the Gospels that, that Thomas was not there the first time that Jesus Christ appeared. And he made a foolish statement and said, listen, I'm not going to believe that Jesus Christ is alive unless I can, can touch his hand and put my hand on his side. He's basically saying, I won't believe it unless I can verify it myself. So Peter, you're a nice guy, but you don't cut the mustard for me. And John, you're, you're an upstanding citizen, but you know what? I don't believe Jesus Christ is alive, even though Jesus Christ has said he was going to rise. And even though everyone that he knew and trusted as his friends said they had interacted with Jesus, Thomas said, I'm not believing 
unless I see it for myself and verify it myself. Jesus Christ, a few days or moment, a few days later, shows up again, and now Thomas is here. And Jesus Christ has a way of interacting with our, our questions. And Jesus Christ called Thomas to come. Thomas basically said, Thomas, come here. Thomas, I want you to touch him. And at that point, Thomas lost all the bravado. As stern as he was before, saying, I got to see this. I don't trust you. As soon as Jesus Christ appears, Thomas is like, oh, no, okay, I give up. Time out. All right, I'm tapping out. All right, Jesus Christ, okay, you're really alive. But then Jesus Christ makes this statement to us. And look in verse 29. Because this is part of the reason that John is penning to us and writing to us this gospel. Jesus says this. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Now that statement was written to Thomas, to the disciples, and no doubt when John wrote these words, there were many during that time, 85 or 95 A.D., that had not seen Jesus Christ. He'd already passed off the scene. But my friends, since that point, 100 A.D. and now in 2023, there are many people who have followed Jesus Christ, and we have not seen him. And the gospel of John to us is given to us partly for those who have not seen will be blessed when we still believe. Your Bible's open still. Please turn back to the the gospel of John, chapter number 3, where we'll find our text and our story for today. Today we're going to deal with a man by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to us the first time in John, chapter 3. Nicodemus, and this particular account of Nicodemus is a fairly famous account because in John chapter 3 we find one of the most familiar verses in, in, Christian, in Christendom. And that's John chapter 3 and verse number 16. If you could direct your attention there, if you don't know it by heart, where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This verse has been quoted in sermons, written in gospel tracts. In fact, the church that I grew up in with uh, Dr. Paul Vanneman, he told a story about the John 3.16 house story. Maybe sometime I'll tell the story here. This story about what God has done and by giving his only son, Jesus Christ. It's found in this account with, with, with Nicodemus. And today, with the Holy Spirit's help, I want us to Maybe read this story one more time and find out some things about Nicodemus that I think will help us. Some things that Nicodemus did that were good and some things that Nicodemus did that perhaps weren't exactly how we ought to respond to Jesus Christ. Knowing this, that blessed are those who have seen, but more blessed are those who believe and have not been able to see him yet. That's Lord's help on this time. Lord, we love you. Lord, I ask your help this morning. Lord, we look at the story of Nicodemus, and for some to be familiar, for others it may be brand new. Lord, I ask that your word would touch us today. Lord, that you would direct us to the truths here that would change us and transform us to be like Jesus Christ. And Lord, the issues that we face, I pray that today you'd give us victory and help. Those who know you and claim you as Savior, Lord, we need you. We need you every moment of the day. Lord, those who don't know you as Savior and have not called upon you for forgiveness of their sins, Lord, I pray that today would be the day they do that. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. Nicodemus, during Bible times, during this time, was a pretty famous and well-known individual. Nicodemus was a, not only famous and well-known, was a fairly wealthy individual. And Scripture will help us with that in a few moments. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. I am told that during this time in the nation of Israel, there probably were around six, only 6,000 Pharisees, varying ages and varying positions. So although, although there were 6,000, 6,000 was a small number with the nation of Israel and the, and the country around there. Beyond that, Nicodemus was a part of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling part of the Pharisees. 
set up during the time of Moses when Moses wanted others to help him rule over the nation of Israel. There were during this time, I am told, 70 individuals who would rule over the entire nation in matters of religious and ceremonial and apart from the Roman Empire, even other judgment-type decisions. And Nicodemus was one of the 70. Which meant that most places Nicodemus would have gone, he would have been known. He was well respected. He had the fame. He had the money, which we'll see later on in the sermon. And Nicodemus had the religion. Because the Pharisees were very strict. They were very careful about how many tassels were on their clothes. In fact, the Bible tells us that the Pharisees would be so careful with the law that they would, that, that they would observe the tithe or giving of the 10%. That when they got some herbs, perhaps uh, some, some basil or some mint, they would tithe off the mint. So if they got a bunch of mint, they would count them, all right? And they would make sure that 10% went to the temple, to God. That's how careful they were. Now, throughout the Gospels, Jesus Christ often went after the religious people. Not... Not because he hated them, but because they hated him. And they wouldn't believe in him. They justify themselves. Now Nicodemus is here, and he has done all these things. He, I'm sure, has dotted every I and crossed every T. He would go to the marketplace, and no doubt people would, would whisper, say, that's Nicodemus. That's Nicodemus. That's Nicodemus. Wow. Look at that master, the teacher of Israel. Jesus calls him that. Well-respected, influential, and wealthy. And yet we come to this portion of Scripture and we find out that Nicodemus was seeking. Look in the first verse. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Verse number two. The same came to Jesus. I want you to notice that Nicodemus came seeking He's going to ask you a few questions. In fact, he came to Jesus by night and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus came seeking God. He came seeking to know more about Jesus Christ. He desired to know some truth. He wanted to know, what is this all about? He said, listen, we know that all that you're doing is not mere coincidence. Isn't it interesting how people will take what God is doing and often chalk it up to coincidence? You know that God is answering your prayers, but your unsaved co-worker? Well, that's odd. That's weird. That's crazy how that just worked out. My friends, when God works, it is not mere coincidence. His hand is not accidental in our life. God answers direct requests, and he works in powerful ways. And Nicodemus, as he's seeking Jesus Christ, notices that what Jesus is doing is not mere coincidence. Listen, there are some here this morning who you doubt whether God really works for you. Maybe you've heard about it for someone else. You've heard about prayer, and and maybe you've been coming to church for a long time, and you're like, but I have not seen God work for me. Now, I've challenged the church this way. I'll challenge you this morning. I hope that you pray for some things that only you pray for, because you need to know that God hears your prayers, and you need to know that your God will answer you directly. I'm glad that God hears you, but I am blessed because God hears me. I'm excited that God answers your request, but I am personally thankful and touched when God answers my requests. And listen, Nicodemus came seeking God. You can try to discount it. You can try to explain it. But Nicodemus, he came there seeking. You know that the Bible says that God honors those who seek after him? God honors those who come seeking him. And we live in a time when many people want nothing to do with God. You give someone a gospel tract, and they say, you know, no thank you, I'm okay. You know what? They may think they're okay today, but there will come a moment in time when they won't be okay. 
You'll find out that people, that we go to First Baptist Church, I go to First Baptist Church, they'll find out I'm the pastor here. And, and often as a pastor, I get this response. Man, I need to go to church. I need to go to church. I always agree with that person. Every time. I'm like, yeah, you do. They said it. I'm just agreeing with them. I'm like, yeah, you do. I'm like, yeah, you need Jesus. <laughs> no, no, I don't say that. I don't say that. I say, you, you need to come to church. They're like, boy... I'm like, right, listen, come to First Baptist Church. I said, come check us out. I said, this is what you'll find at First Baptist Church. We're going to sing some songs and worship the Lord. Then we're going to open up the Word of God, and I'll try to present a truth from the Word of God. But there are not a lot of people who are seeking after God. You can drive past a golf course Sunday morning, Green Acres. It's not the most expensive golf course around here, but it's full Sunday mornings. It's full Sunday mornings. You can go past houses and you see TVs on and people cutting their grass. But Nicodemus came. Listen, God doesn't turn away those who seek after him. God does not turn away those who seek after him. And I hope you are a seeker. Whether you have not come to Christ for salvation yet, seek after God. Maybe you've been saved for 55 or 75 or 91 years. Seek after God. Not only was he a seeker, he was scared. He came by night. Now, why did Nicodemus came by night? Why did he come by night? Right? He was scared. He was scared. He was scared of what the other Sanhedrin, the other 69, would say about him. We find out later on that they plot to kill Jesus Christ. He was scared. But he didn't let his fear control him. Try to teach my kids this since they were young. I've seen people paralyzed by fear. Good people. Ah, I just don't know. I just can't follow God. I've seen people paralyzed when they won't trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Ah, I should. But what will my friends think? What will my family think? What will my coworkers think? And unfortunately, there will be people who will be in hell for all eternity because of fear. Because of fear. Because they're afraid of what others will think if they follow Jesus Christ. But it doesn't just touch those who are unsaved. It touches those who are saved. Those who claim the name of Jesus Christ, there are those who are unsaved who will not reap the blessing of God because they're afraid of completely following God. They're afraid of obeying him when he speaks to them and touches them from the word of God. They're afraid to follow God. Listen, be careful and don't let fear control you. Oh my goodness, our minds can go 100 miles an hour in the 100 different wrong directions. We can think about the end of the end and by the end of the end, what happens? The world is gone. Our life is over. We are hopeless and helpless, and God has let us down. And that's in the first 15 seconds. What will, what will God do if he calls me to be a missionary? You know, we think about, when we think about that, when God calls us to be a missionary, we think, well, of course it's going to be to Africa, to a hut with no running water, because that's where God's going to call us. He wouldn't let us minister in some place that had running water. Of course, God doesn't work that way. That's what our minds do. And we get afraid. What if I trust God with my finances? What if I put him first? You know what? I won't be able to afford anything. I'll lose my house. My kids will be homeless. We won't have any food. We will die. Fear. Fear. What if I talk to my coworker about Jesus Christ? Well, I can't do that. They will get mad. They will complain to management. Management will call me in, and they will fire me. And then I will lose my house, and my kids will be homeless. We won't have any food, and my kids will starve and die. See, I can't share the gospel this way. Fear. It's a powerful, a powerful distraction in our life. Nicodemus was afraid, but he didn't let fear control him. I've told this story here, but it just, I think it bears repeating. Early on, we're teaching our kids this story. Johnny and Doreen and I and James were going up to Camp Kobiak. 
They have a zip line there at Camp Kobiak, and one of my rules was you have to try everything once. All right? You don't have to like it, kids. You do it one time. And uh, the zip line, it was very safe. Camp Kobiak, I mean, you know, stringent safety things. And get there, Johnny, I think, was around four at this time, and James was two. So I get there, and uh, we get the bottom of the zip line, and to a four-year-old, this looks like Mount Everest. And I went out there, it was junior camp time, and I said, hey, I said, John, you got to go on the zip line, and, and he's crying. He's wailing. He's holding on to Doreen's, I think she had a jean skirt. I still remember gripping on a je Doreen's jean skirt there at Camp Kobiak. Doreen's looking at me like, okay, are you sure, honey? I mean, she, she, we're on the same page, but she was like, all right, really, honey? You know, <laughs> Lord, help my husband. I don't kill him. I said, Johnny, let's go. So we begin the Bantam Death March up the hill to the zip line. All the way up, Johnny is wailing up this march up the hill. And he's wailing all the way up. We get to the top of this hill. We get on this little, this little stand for the zip line. And, uh, you know, a little, little ledge right there. There's a, a counselor, a worker there from Camp Kobiak, and she's a college student. And she is looking at me with so much disdain. I got knocked her out. She's like that look like, what kind of father are you that you would do that? I mean, Johnny's just wailing. I mean, he's wailing. He would, I mean, he's just wailing. I mean, she's strapped, checking the straps on there. She's on there checking his helmet and everything and putting him on there. And I mean, just, just shoot me death glances, really. He's crying, so she's like, you have to jump. But he doesn't jump. I have to push him off the ledge. <laughs> I have to push him off, right? Honey, I'm not, right? I'm, I pushed him off. So now, I mean, she wanted to push me off the ledge, all right? <laughs> So, yeah, Doreen wanted to push me off the ledge. Yeah. So he pushed off this ledge, and he's, and he's bzz, he whizzing down the, the zip line. Bzz, ah, wailing. Bzz, ah, bzz, ah, and he's really light, so he goes to the end. Bzz, ah, bzz, ah, bzz, ah, wailing, wailing, wailing. All right? And uh, they get him off, and I go down. I'm a lot fatter than Johnny. I'm like, bzz, boom, and, I'm, and I'm down there. So Johnny's down, he's like, now he's just like his, his head in, the, in Doreen's skirt, just crying. I'm like, okay. You know, so we, we finish up, and I'm like, you know, <laughs> good dad moment. And <laughs> um, it was two weeks later. Went back up to see Aaron and Tina Wilson, the director of Camp Kobiak, and we're in a van. The wife's in the passenger seat. I'm driving, and Johnny and James in the back seat. We're about 15, 20 minutes from Camp Kobiak, and all of a sudden from the back seat, Johnny goes, hey, Dad. When we get to Camp Kobe, can I ride the zip line? <laughs> now, I do not recommend this in marriage. I'm going to tell you what I did. It's, it's not right. It's, it, you shouldn't do it. I look at Doreen, and I smiled. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm confessing my faults among you all. And, but I was a little surprised. And I said... Well, Johnny, I thought you hated it. Or I thought you were scared of it. He goes, no, that was fun. I said, okay, buddy. And then James, two-year-old, pipes up. I want to write it too. Now listen, I'm not saying I'm a good dad. No, I'm just saying what I've tried to teach my kids, don't let fear control you. But I can promise you this. When you follow Jesus Christ... He won't let you down. There may be fear involved, right? You may be scared. You may be going down the zip line of life feeling like, ah, bzz, ah. But I can promise you, I can promise you beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will enjoy serving Jesus Christ. And when you, when you ride the ride of Jesus Christ, if I can, you will influence others every time. I promise you. Nicodemus was scared, but remember that our love for God ought to drive away our fear. Not only was he afraid, look at Scripture quickly, he was skeptical. Verse number 3, Jesus said this, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? From verse 3, Pretty much until verse 21, we have Jesus Christ now explaining to Nicodemus what salvation looked like. And Nicodemus, he was seeking God and he was scared, but he was skeptical. He said, listen, what are you trying to say, Jesus? 
It doesn't make sense to me. And know this, there are times that when Jesus Christ will speak to us, it will not make sense to us. What? A soft answer turns away wrath? That doesn't make sense. Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things shall be added unto me? That doesn't make sense. That by believing in something I can't see is more solid than believing in something I can see? That doesn't make sense. And Nicodemus is skeptical. And Jesus Christ began to explain how a man must be born again. He's not talking of water, but by the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ began to explain how, just like in the Old Testament, when Moses lifted up a serpent on a staff, and it was in response to snakes biting the children of Israel, and when someone looked at the serpent on the staff lifted up, they found relief and they found help. Jesus Christ said that if I will be lifted up, signifying the death on the cross, and explaining that when we believe in Jesus Christ and look to him, we will find salvation. Through all of this, Nicodemus is silent. We find that verse, in verse 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he believed hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But then Jesus Christ said this in verse number 19 and 20, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men loved darkness, rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Two more verses, and Jesus Christ is done speaking. I mean, notice in this passage of Scripture of Nicodemus' response. And Scripture tells us nothing. Nothing. We don't know what Nicodemus said, we don't know how he responded. Other times in the scripture, we find that people gladly receive the word. In fact, when Jesus Christ is at the, at the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, when she finishes interacting with Jesus Christ and believing in Jesus, she runs back and brings everyone back to Jesus. Not so with Nicodemus. We don't see his response. We see some silence and nothing. We see the, the man who was healed and, and the demons cast out. He stayed back and proclaimed Jesus Christ, but Nicodemus was silent. I want you to just think about this. Make sure your story doesn't end with the wrong response. There are times in Scripture we find that people heard Jesus Christ, heard about Jesus Christ, and one said to Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You could come to church every single week. You could read the whole Bible and you could still be lost and going to hell. Because we must personally, individually respond to Jesus Christ. But even though that's the end of this story, that's not the end of Nicodemus' story. We find Nicodemus two more times in the Scripture. We'll turn to one, John chapter 19, and I'll tell you about the other. In John chapter 7, we'll find Nicodemus again, but don't turn there. I'll tell you about it. In John chapter 7, we're going to find a group of the Sanhedrin, the high-ranking Pharisees, arguing about Jesus Christ. And there's a man who defends Jesus, a man by the name of, help me, Nicodemus. But John chapter 19, I find something powerful to end with today. Look in John chapter 19 Verse number 39. Jesus Christ has been crucified. Jesus Christ needs to be buried. Here the scripture says, And there came also Nicodemus. Now just in case you're wondering which one it is, John clarifies for us, which at the first came to Jesus by night. Now help me, if John says, which at the first came to Jesus by night, does that not mean that he came back to Jesus? You, you see that? He said, he said, now this is Nicodemus who at, at the first, the first time, 
came to Jesus by night. But, but something happened from that first interaction. You see that? Something took place where that wasn't all that happened in Nicodemus' life. And here it is, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Some think maybe 75, something 100, whatever that number exactly, but, but here it is. That myrrh and those burial spices in current money would have cost 150 to $200,000. Nicodemus was wealthy. And Jesus Christ dies, and Nicodemus gives almost a little less than a quarter of a million dollars for the man he first came to by night. You see, not only was Nicodemus a seeker, not only was he scared, not only was he skeptical, but Nicodemus became a sacrificer. He sacrificed. I can't help but think of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where the Bible says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Holy, acceptable, which is your reasonable service. My friends, Nicodemus put his trust, his faith, his hope in Jesus Christ. And that's what God wants from us, to sacrifice for him. He doesn't just ask for $200,000 for a burial. He asks that you and I present ourselves. And yet, and yet, we're stingy. Someone said this. The trouble with living sacrifices is that they keep crawling off the altar. And there are times, my friends, that we ought to present ourselves to God, but we'll have to represent ourselves. God, use me today. God, use me right now. God, right now, I'm crawling off the altar. All right, I'm not feeling very sacrificial. I'm not feeling, uh, I'm not feeling very giving to you right now. Lord, I'm selfish right now. You, I'm giving myself back to you. And Nicodemus, who was scared, Nicodemus, who was skeptical, Nicodemus began to sacrifice for Jesus Christ. I'm going to challenge you today, challenge myself. We need to become sacrifices for Jesus Christ. The Bible says it's a reasonable service. For some, it ought to be for salvation. Lord, I trust you. And you alone. Lord, I set my thoughts aside. Lord, I set my will aside. I trust you for salvation. For others, Lord, you have me right now. And you don't have just part of me. You have all of me. Lord, you have every bit of me today. Usually, giving our life for Jesus Christ is not glorious. Usually, giving our life for Jesus Christ consists of the small, individual decisions all day long. It's not just a Sunday morning decision or a Sunday night decision. It's a Monday morning decision and a Tuesday afternoon decision and a Wednesday evening decision and a Thursday morning, afternoon, and evening decision and Friday and Saturday, and then it begins again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Maybe you're here today, you're seeking God. Come to him today. Maybe you're here today and you're scared of following God. Follow him today. Maybe you're here and you're skeptical of who God is and what he said. Listen, trust him. He's the way, the truth, and life. And maybe you're here today and you've crawled off the altar. Crawl back on.